in reference to the last letter to the coroner. Firstly, I would like to thank you for releasing the actual photograph of William as the photocopy that had been released to the public appeared stretched and gave a distorted view of the image. The picture on the left is the photocopy and when you compare it to the photo that was released later, the difference is evident. In the timestamp, as can be seen on top of the photocopy, there is a two hour discrepancy. But as yet, we have not heard the results of the independent metadata experts findings, or have we been given any reason for why this has happened? Speculations range from that the time on the camera had never been set properly in the first place, to the time was changed to match the story told of when the photo of William was taken. Hopefully, the results will shed some light on the case, as nothing else has so far, regardless of the numerous searches of nearby bushland and the many interviews and questioning of a growing list of suspects. Finding out what happened to William doesn't appear to have moved any closer to being solved than since the first day he was reported missing. Mr Craddock told the inquest that 97% of child abductions in the United States involved family members or close acquaintances, although he added, but a stranger could have taken William and suggested that William was likely taken by car. Why even put forward that a stranger could have taken William or even suggest that William was likely taken by car? This isn't a fact, it's an assumption that is not warranted and could lead the investigation into falsely diverting the course of justice. As we wait for the return of the test results of the timestamp on the photographs, I find myself becoming rather sceptical about what the results will show. Time, in the William Tyrrell case, appears to change to suit the circumstances. It was clearly stated, and has been from the beginning, that William initially went missing at around 10.30am, just prior to the foster father's arrival back to the grandmother's house from Lakewood. When the emergency call was made at 10.57am, the foster mother reported that William had been missing for about five minutes before she commenced a search of between 15 to 20 minutes, which, as the triple O operator figured out, would make the time of William's disappearance at about 10.30am. Then this time of 10.30am was changed to an approximate time of 10.15am, and then it was changed again at the inquest to possibly 10.10am. At this rate, it will be 10 a.m. or earlier the next time we're here. No explanation has ever been provided as to why the time is continually being changed. You can't just pick a suitable time to suit the story and then keep changing it because it doesn't fit. Imagine if this was done for all the suspects. The foster father is told by the foster mother on his arrival home that William had been missing for five minutes, but how could this be when she tells us how busy she had been searching the yard and house several times? She had driven to the riding school where she had an encounter with a man driving a semi-trailer on Batar Creek Road. Was this semi ever investigated? Were heavy vehicles permitted on Batar Creek Road at the time of the encounter? What was the weight load that was permitted on the road? This may be worth checking into. Was there an inquiry into what trucks were in the area at that time? Did it make a delivery? What companies, if any, had a semi-trailer in that area on that day and at that time? Did anyone else see the truck on Batar Creek Road besides the foster mother? Did the driver of this truck ever come forward to verify the foster mother's story? Was this claim made by the foster mother ever investigated? And if so, what were the findings? A semi on a narrow country road 
would have surely been noticed. Maybe the driver of the semi is set to present when the inquest resumes, as such important information should not be dismissed without close examination. The foster mother then claims to have pulled into the riding school, realised William wasn't there, and she then drove back to the grandmother's house. She parked in the, the car and then shortly after walked back down to the end of Benaroon Drive and somewhere on Batar Creek Road, she thought she heard a child scream. She described that it was like when a child hurts themselves. Unexpectedly, there's a scream and it felt like a scream. It was quick and it was high pitched and it was sharp, she recalled. She went into the bush to investigate and after thinking it may have been a bird, she came out of the bush and walked back up Benaroon Drive where it is said she had met a neighbour. Why did the foster mother take two trips, one in the car and the other on foot down Benaroon Drive to Batar Creek Road? Wouldn't it be plausible to consider that after searching in one direction without finding any trace of William, that you would look in another direction? Why would you head off in the same direction that turned up no result? When did the foster mother in first inform the police of this incident? Such a description as given by the foster mother would have surely sent the investigators scurrying to the spot. Were the dogs brought in? Was the area immediately cordoned off? Were forensics taken and the area searched? Well, it appears not by all accounts. The foster mother had dismissed what had sounded to her initially to be a child's scream and she thought it may have been a bird and that's it. No further inquiry into this necessary. Why? She also thought it was a child's scream and a child had gone missing. Why then would this have been dismissed without any further investigation? Also, I am no mathematician, but I can figure out that in five minutes it would have been impossible for the foster mother to do all the things that she claimed she had done. The foster mother received a text message from the foster father telling her that he would be home in five minutes. We then have the foster father arriving home and he points out to us that his wife is sitting in the deck chair and she tells him that William was just here and that he had only been missing for five minutes. If what the foster father is saying is true, then all that the foster mother told us could not have happened. If what the foster father is telling us is false, then why would he be claiming this conversation between him and his wife took place when he arrived back from Lakewood if it didn't? It is obvious that they both can't be speaking the truth as they are both telling totally different stories. Did the foster mother do all the searching that she had claimed she had done? Or was it as a foster father claims that she was sitting in the deck chair and she told him William was missing for five minutes and she couldn't find him? Now I ask you, can anyone expect to find a missing child while sitting in a deck chair? The William Tyrrell case has too many twists and turns to count. There doesn't appear to be any interest at all in looking at the foster parents as suspects which seems to be blinding the whole investigation. It is almost as if being anonymous has not only made the foster carers faceless, but also invisible and untouchable. And what gets forgotten is that they were the last people to see William before he disappeared. So what the foster carers have to say is more relevant than what anyone has to say. And they are obviously not being listened to because if they were, then I wouldn't be one of just a handful that are pointing out the numerous contradictions. Either that or something else is going on behind the scenes that I simply am not privy to. Makes you wonder with all these tight-lipped investigative journalists 
reporting the same views and playing it safe without any actual investigation happening at all. So back to trying to figure out some of this confusion. The foster father also tells us that within five minutes of his arrival home from Lakewood that his wife phoned the triple O operator. If this was true, then the triple O operator would have been phoned at about 10.35 a.m. But we all know that the call to the operator was at 10.57 a.m. How could anyone figure out what is going on when you have so many different stories happening? No one is making up these stories about the foster parents. It is them telling us these different stories themselves. Can they all be true? And if not, what would be the motivation behind such contradictions? As pointed out in one of the other letters to the coroner, when the truth is told, there is only one story. And even more importantly, why are all the contradictions being brushed aside with more and more stories about how, how loving the foster parents are? We were told so early in the case that the foster parents were totally ruled out as suspects. How can this be so? What evidence has ever been put forward that could automatically give them an immunity of having any involvement at all to do with the Williams' disappearance? This is a serious question and obviously one that needs addressing. The public has never been given any credible reason as to why the foster parents should be ruled out as suspects. This case has always been driven on the assumption that the foster parents are innocent. That is a fact, not a story, and it is unfair for all concerned, including the foster parents. Until the doubt is removed, they are as much a suspect as anyone else, and the doubt will never be removed unless you investigate them as you investigate other suspects in the case. Can all these stories be true? Have you considered asking the foster parents and other suspects if they would be prepared to take a polygraph test? This case will never be solved while the investigators are relying more on stories and fact. No one knows how loving the foster parents are, and that's a fact. The foster parents have continually changed their story, and that's a fact. William could not have been missing for only five minutes before the foster father arrived home, with all that the foster mother has claimed that she had done, and that's a fact. So, coroner, could you please sort out the fact out from the fiction? And please ask Mr. Craddock if he could stop repeating the stories he is hearing as if they are true. William doesn't stand a chance to be found unless you do. When you get straight the initial content in comparison to the changed version, none of it rings true. Please check this out. Do it for William and every other little boy or girl that finds himself in a similar situation. Set a precedent that Australians are not going to leave any stone untouched when it comes to our children. There is no doubt that this case has gone global. And if many of us can see the discrepancies, then so can others, regardless of how the media is playing it out. I understand that this is no easy task, as many leads have been neglected in the past. But I would like to think that we could have faith in our legal system to do what is right. The search for William has become lost amongst the fundraising squabbles, the police squabbles, the false accusations, lead detectives being charged and fabricated stories and yet in true essence it is about an innocent little boy that disappeared without a trace. Once again I would like to thank you and ask that you take my points into consideration. Kind regards, Jan.